I can talk over the rest of you guys, I think, I believe. So, all right, welcome everybody. My name is Randy Meddy with Winfield United. Um, I am the seed product manager that's covering Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, touch into the southern tip of uh, Michigan and even up into New York. So, uh, my responsibilities are corn and soybean advancement products within the cropland bag. Okay, so the new experimental stuff that you're seeing within the answer plot system. I'm working with the genetic suppliers on the back side to help bring some of that stuff forth in the cropland bag. But also working with our partner brands, DeKalb, Asgro, NK, Syngenta, um, Corteva, Bravant, everybody else within, our, within Superior's umbrella, work with them as well to understand their products and how they work, um, interactive across the, uh, across the environments as well. So um, again, here to support Superior. Why does Superior have the, the breadth and the product portfolio that they've got today? A is to give you, each one, each one of you and your operations, the opportunity to have access to the best genetics, the latest genetics within the industry, and also the latest traits. Those that we've got today, and also those that are coming forth in the future. So you may ask, is every trait that on the market today, you? utilized by me or have utility within my operation? Maybe, maybe not. Does smart stacks play for you guys? Some, it may, some it may not. Is, is VT Double Pro more of an option for you? Maybe, maybe not. Is E3 from an ICAMBA and or 24D standpoint? So 24D is your E3 trait. Extend Flex is gonna be your ICAMBA trait. Where do they play within the operation? Now looking forward into the future, what are some of the future trades coming to forth? Coming forth, um, there will be some that are hitting the market this year. One of them is going to be Smart Stacks Pro. Again, I understand that we're kind of in that area where we're not have a lot of rootworm pressure, unless we're continuous corn on corn. Uh, so that's going to bring another new technology to the, to the market using RNAi RNA technology. So it's another way to infect that gut on the uh, on the on the corn rootworm to help ward against resistance. We've got some of that moving forth in the DeKalb brand, also in the Cropland brand as well. Looking a little bit more long-term on corn. 2026, 27, uh, maybe even a little bit sooner than that, we're gonna look at a VT4 Pro, okay? So what is that? VT4 Pro is developed by Bayer, and it's gonna have above ground protection, below ground protection, but they're dropping out the Herculex trait okay so from an industry perspective Herculex is a very good product very good trait but it comes with some baggage on the breeders side as we're introducing into new genetics there's a lot there can be some stuff and some 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 things we're missing from a hybrid perspective so they're dropping out Herculex gonna be adding in Tricepta so earworm control stuff like that bringing that in that's gonna be a new one coming forth we've all heard and probably have heard a little bit about short statured corn if we want to call it smart, smart corn, you'll see it back here later. That's going to be coming forth as well. That is not going to be a genetically modified trait on the initial release, all right? We're probably looking at 26, 27 for that trait to be released. But it's going to give some utility on some of the stuff that we talk about today on how we continually change some operations, some management um, systems within what you guys do and how you can effectively get across more acres at a timely fashion to change things up a little bit to drive more yield, okay? Flipping to soybeans. In the near future, 26, probably 27, you're gonna see an HT4 trait hit the market. That's probably gonna be coming, that will be coming from Bayer again. So what is HT4? And how could that change what my operation looks like today? HT4 is gonna be resistant to Liberty, glufosinate, Roundup, It'll be resistant to 24D, which is not going to be the 24D trait from Corteva. It's the own tra their own developed trait within Bayer. You're going to have resistance to dicamba. <coughs> Why they call it HT4 trait, not sure, but there's going to be a fifth one in there. You're going to have resistance to HPPD. <coughs> HPPD is mesotrione, okay? So that gives you another tool in your arsenal to where you can run additional chemistry that's typically not available on soybeans to help on some of your problem weeds out there. 
That's probably looking 2026, 27 as well, mid, <coughs> mid 20s. And then end of the end of the uh, decade here, you're probably looking at you're gonna be looking at HT5. Okay, that's actually gonna have six herbicide resistant traits in it. The five that I listed, the last ones, the, the HT5 <coughs> will have additional PPO resistance as well. So that's kind of a quick and easy over the, what the industry is bringing forth in the near future. The good thing is each and every one of you will have access to those as soon as they hit the market through Superior's offerings. Okay. With that, Tom, I'll t dump it over to you. All right. I feel like I had a sleep study here with all these wires attached to me or something, but uh, I'll try not to blow you out. I'm a loud talker. But most of you guys I've met at some point. I'm Tom Sennett from Winfield United. I'm approaching on the two-decade mark of working in this area between my time at Superior and Winfield United. Uh, it's Randy's job. You know, he's looking at a broader spectrum on a, a national or regional level for uh, product advancement. And I work with him at a, at a more local level for what's doing best for us here. Um, I did want to let you guys know that we did have somebody that was a lot smarter and better looking than me that was supposed to do this part of the talk this year. And then a couple days ago, uh, they had to back out. And uh, if you guys have worked with me before, you know that uh, I've said that the data suggests that all farmers love a voluptuous redhead. And so this is unfortunately what you got. This is as good as it gets for me. So I did want to talk about uh, seed a little different this year than what we normally do. You know, honestly, we have a lot of great relationships with farmer dealers in the area. And so we tend to be a little bit more conservative when we talk about uh, seed at Superior Ag, especially at plot days when we're up and whatnot. But we're seeing some pretty drastic differences with your help. And we felt like it was very important that we dove into that at a deeper level uh, today. You know, I feel like if we found a new chemistry that you guys could use on your operation and it wasn't going to cost you any more than a chemistry you're already using but we've got four years of data on all your farms with thousands of, uh, of points to show that we're going to get an eight to ten bushel increase every damn one of us would do it right it's just something about seed that makes it a little bit more personal and and whatnot so i want to jump in um, you know whenever you buy seed from superior ag we currently have access to every trait supplier every genetic supplier uh, available in the United States through our, our brand, brand platforms. There's really not anything that you can get anywhere else that you can't get here. Uh, and we do have the flagship uh, brands of those product offerings with NK, Zotavo, DeKalb, Asgro, uh, Bravant Seeds. Um, through the, the merger of, of Corteva, you know, they have their, their more of their farmer dealer brand with Pioneer. The ag retail brand is Bravant. They're really trying to launch that product. So I can tell you even from that side that we used to not have, we're getting the very best products that they have to offer in that lineup as well. So um, then when I think of cropland, it's more like a national regional brand, you know, whereas some of the national suppliers they're looking at, I need 112 day that covers a broader spectrum where me, if I have 112 day that looks really good in my area, that's really all I care about, right? So we'll have a, a little bit broader, um, book but whenever we deliver that to you guys i can promise you we have seeds in our seed guide that suck too no different than everybody else but we tend to hone those down to a small group before we give that so again you guys have access to everything here um these are actually out of order this slide here it's a little bit busy hopefully you guys can all see it uh, some of you guys have helped make this there's literally thousands of hours into to making this set and the, I want to explain this to you. This is kind of what I was talking about earlier on the advancement that we've seen. So what we do is we take our top 10 products in volume sales uh, that we project for the following season and we make what's called a core set. And then we, um, we add to that. So if any of you guys have ever planted a plot with us, you know that we have 10 or 12 hybrids on this set, but we're, we show up, Chris, what, with like 25 bags or something, see what we have room for, and we try to fit as many in as we can. But we're going to make sure that these products are in every, every plot that we do because it's all about replication, right? We could all, Chris, I could come and show you the plot down the road that did great and then leave the plot that I got my butt kicked down the road at home and just not talk to you about that one. And that's pretty common in the industry. So I like to look at everything as a whole. So we'll take those top 10 products. We do call um, the, the representation from Pioneer for the area, and we ask them for their number one and number two volume products for us to compete against. It's not something that we're picking ourselves to do that. And then we put them in a contest together across all environments. So 
Uh, they're actually in quite a few more plots than that, but you guys know sometimes we put a plot in and then a water hole takes out part of it, or that creek that never gets out gets a little far into the field, or we have a yield monitor issue or something. And so these are the ones that actually statistically were safe. It's not ones that we won or lost. It's just everyone that had sound data that we put into here. And then they're kind of color coded rank, ranked here. So what we're showing is uh, for our top 10 volume products, we're averaging about an eight bushel advantage for the price of corn this year. Uh, that's a little over $100 a bag. So when you guys heard Eric at his stop, he was telling you that, you know, we have many of the guys in the room that are buying all their chemistry from us, but they may not be buying their seed. If they would check that final box, that qualifies them for that program. And there's $100 a bag bag. So if we're 10 bucks too high, or we have something that's kind of keeping you from making that decision to want to make that jump, we can share a lot of that risk with you for any of the brands that, that we have. Uh, more so than that, this is over the four year history and you can see we used an average price of 415, which that's pretty conservative. If you took the last four years uh, price and added it together, we're seeing about a nine bushel advantage and still approaching a hundred dollar bag difference. So I think, you know, where I told you earlier, we're a little more conservative when we talk about this, we've got enough data that I really think if you just took our hybrids and threw them on the wall, we can perform with the best of them because we've honed these numbers down. But the real value comes into matching up how you farm versus how you farm and placing those hybrids uh, specifically. So we know that uh, obviously hybrids respond differently to fertility and drainage. You know, there's really not a hybrid out there that likes wet feet, but there are some that tolerate a little more than others. So with working with you guys, we get hung up in some of your fields too. So we know where some of those wet holes are or the poorly drained clays. So that helps us on that product selection. Uh, your nitrogen practices early versus late. There's a hybrid uh, right up the, the road here called 4997 from Cropland. It has the most narrow root profile of any hybrid I think that we've ever sold. So when we're looking at droughty tough acres, you know that one's gonna be able to intercept water really well. But the problem is, is that hybrid also has like the highest response to nitrogen late in the season of any hybrid that I think we've ever sold as well. So if we're, we're telling you to use that because your ground is dry and it's droughty and you guys aren't a side dress application operation, you're not going to get the experience from that hybrid that you want at all. And so that's why we need to make sure we're matching that up. Management practices that really comes down to fungicide and late season plant health. So micronutrients or anything that you're doing to keep that plant alive longer. Uh, we have things like certain hybrids that really express their yield in kernel depth. And so if you have a guy that doesn't typically use a, a late fungicide or is a little bit conservative on the backside, he's not gonna get the experience with that, that hybrid either. Uh, your price constraints, that's probably the one that I, I think most of us struggle with the most. You know, everybody loves to beat up on their seed guy, just like their tractor guy and, you know, truck guy, whatever it is, you know, you're, you're not going to pay with the first price they give you, right? Well, what happens is a lot of times is I may have a hybrid Keith that I think is perfect for your operation and it's newer or whatever, or they know it's a more valuable hybrid. And so it may be 20 bucks a bag more than the second choice or third choice that I have. But if that guy's always beating me up on that price, or I know even before I go out there, that that's going to be the issue. I may pick that second or third option. So we really caution our guys not to do that. And that's maybe sometimes why we get, uh, you know, we're 10 bucks over. It's because of the hybrids that were selection. Uh, population comfort, comfort levels, that makes sense from a flex or a fixed standpoint. Uh, your planting and harvest timing. This actually changes more, changes the hybrid selection more than you think. I'll talk about this one here. Uh, this is a comparison that was right down the road from here last year. Both of those are the same maturity. Both of them were in that top 10 set that I, I showed you here a second ago. Uh, both of them were well over 200 bushels and that's where this guy was gonna start his harvest. So he was tickled to death to get, he would have been tickled to death to get into this 110 day hybrid and have it be 220 bushel an acre to start his harvest with the big number, but would he have been happier with this one? There was no difference in there, in the, that just that this hybrid matched his management style better than others. So if your seed supplier, if he's showing you a hill corn or bottom corn or anything like that, I can tell you not necessarily run from it, but they're, they're really not doing you a service. They may be doing a good product, throwing it at the board across the region, but the big value is in the in, uh, individual placement. But that's kind of what gives us the edge at Superior Ag is working with you guys on drainage, fertility, 
uh, chemistry, you know, there's certain chemistries that don't jive well in ALSs with certain hybrids. So having that scope, you know, sometimes I feel like the farmers say, well, gosh dang, I give you guys enough money already. You get all my fertilizer and you get all my, all my chemical, right? And it's like, I'm gonna go write a check to somebody else. It's like that seed is the foundation of the yield and that allows us to fine tune everything around it. And I think that we can make you guys more profitable with that decision. So this is kind of what I'm seeing and working on at a local level with your health, help. And uh, Randy's kind of kind of show it as, as a national level and some of the new things coming through the pipeline on nitrogen and fungicide. So over the last 10 years, maybe in the last five years, has it become easier to make decisions on how you're gonna drive your overall and what's gonna impact your overall net yield at the end? Or has it become harder? Maybe it's not as hard, but is there more things to think about, right? You see publications on this, you see publications on that, this, this, this. What's the truth behind all of them? As I look at it, and I've been involved in ag retail for 18 years and been on this side of the business for 10. So I've seen kind of all of it, the step changes going through. It's crazy to me how things have changed and the amount of thought processes and what we can do within the season, growing season on a crop to impact net yield, okay? As we look at over the last three years within the answer plot, last 11 years within the answer plot system, we have always tested for response to population, response to nitrogen, response to fungicide, right? You as growers, once you decide on the population and plant it, that's it, right? You're not gonna change that population unless you replant. What you got is what you got. Did we get it right, did we get it wrong? And how big of an impact is that? Over the last 11 years, that tells us that could vary up and down, but overall the last 11 years could impact 8.6 bushel per acre, okay? Can be statistically different, but I think we can narrow that down and do a little bit better job on a few other things. Nitrogen, last 11 years, from a low rate of nitrogen to an un unlimited rate of nitrogen. So. Depending on locations of the plots, we'll do a limited N application of about 60 pounds of N total for the year. Unlimited, in past, we'd do 260, maybe even 300. We wanted to tease out which ones could handle that low, that didn't need the additional N, which ones were impacted the least, and which ones were impacted the most. But at the end of the day, what did that tell us? We could impact 66 bushel to the acre on average. It varies year to year it varies hybrid to hybrid. So understanding that interaction is another key thing. Fungicide. Fungicide, you can see we didn't start doing any data really in season fungicide applications at an R1 timing until about 2015. So within the last seven years. I think we were dabbling in it years before. But this is something here too that I think as we understand from a genetic supplier standpoint, the interactions between a nitrogen, a fungicide, and what we can impact at the grower level today, at the retail level today with Superior and you guys, it's these two right here. We're looking at 13 bushel on average is what we've seen from fungicide. Now there's years where you're not gonna have a hybrid response on it. We get that, we understand that. You're gonna have a high response to fungicide, a low response to fungicide. But we're gonna take that one step farther. And we started doing that this, this past year to tease some of the data out. So we're gonna look at the hybrid, the interaction between nitrogen and fungicide, the things that you guys can do and manage in season, right? So if you've got a certain amount of dollars per acre that you're gonna spend on nitrogen and fungicide, where and when should I spend that dollar to get the largest ROI? We are driving this information out and you can see the stability map on where we are pulling this information. So we're not just looking at one site location or Southern Indiana or Indiana. We are looking at a pretty good chunk of the, of, the, of the corn growing areas within the United States. So we'll look at it from a nitrogen application, a moderate rate of seven tenths of a pound of N per bushel of expected yield at a high rate of 1.1 to 1.2 pounds of N per expected yield, okay? Then we're gonna look at it and say, okay, how does that hybrid respond in a moderate situation with the fungicide application at V10 or R1. We're pushing things a little bit earlier on the fungicide application. A, plant health. B, 
we're looking at tar spot, right? We've all heard about tar spot. It's starting to creep its way back down. So a sequential application, but if you're going to do a one-shot time, when is the biggest return, for invest, return on investment with that? So in this respective hybrid, 5497, we're seeing about two, two and a half tenths of bushel um, between V10 and R1. On the high application, on the high nitrogen, V10, V10 R1, we're doing it here. 27 bushel right there, okay? Conversely, we look at something from DeKalb, a little bit different. Our, if we're running in a lower nitrogen scenario, boom, we're seeing, it doesn't really matter when, but we're seeing huge responses to, to, to the fungicide there, okay? The key thing is, and I'm not going to go through all the weeds at this, but every hybrid that we test in a decal bag, cropland bag, Bravant, NK, am I missing any? That's it with any answer plot system. We will have this data pulled back, okay, to allow guys like the superior group to go through this type of inf information to match up what you guys do on your farms to generate the, the best time to put this, these products on, if you can, to get your net realized largest ROI. So that's what we're doing internally, some of the backside behind the ground stuff uh, that you don't see out front here, but that's some of the data that we're providing them so that they can provide to you as well. So um, if you guys have seen me much in the spring, I know I put on plots on several uh, of you all. You know, I spend a lot of time uh, with the guys here in the blue shirts dragging a ranger around with shot backs on it. You know, I can honestly say I don't think anybody else in the region does half the amount of seed research that these guys do and across the, the vast footprint that we do it in. So hats off to them, but a, 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 even a hats off to you guys to do this because I know every hour we spend doing it, there's another guy in the tractor spending that same hour with me um, doing it. So it is time out of your schedules as well. So we wanted to say thank you for that and thank you for allowing us to, to build the data set that we've got here. Um, so when we get this harvest off this year, uh, you know, mostly a lot up there, we were talking about more acres or if you wanted to say your similar seed order, putting that in. But when this data comes back, we're going to have another, another layer to add to this. So we, I think we can make a very successful seed recommendation for next year. Is there any questions on anything that we talked about today or some of the pipeline um, products that are coming over uh, this way over the next couple of years? Yes, sir. You kind of gave it away how long you've been in this business. Well, about yeah. 30 years ago, well, we were the decal dealer, and they were talking about corn, yeah. which you could plant, kind of like alfalfa. It would last about four or five years. You would never have to go back out. Is that all gone by the wayside? <laughs> I would say that has gone by the wayside. Yeah, yes, there is no. Really pushing that hard back yeah. About 20, about 30 years ago. They... Well, we need to sell it to you every year, not just once. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> now it will. I mean, if you just let it go ahead, don't even harvest it, and let it reseed itself, it'll grow. Yes. Yeah, get you a gleaner. <laughs> That'll last for yeah. years. Yeah. No, no volunteer <laughs> corn it will. But no, I, I've not, not heard, heard any. It, but that, mm -hmm. were talking about it. Yeah, I've not heard any heard anything over the last well, well 20 I've years. Heard for 25, yeah. 30 years. Yeah. So what we have up behind the, the tent up there, there's actually a short corn demonstration. If you guys didn't see it, the sidewalls are on there. You should take a look at it. You know, I know that this year the corn was inherently shorter because we had a stress period whenever we were in grand growth phase. So those, those nodes didn't spread out like they typically do. So we saw a lot of guys with their high clearance sprayers hitting it with the fungicide. Um, we know that um, when you're spraying a burn down, it's really not the best idea to drag those booms right in the dirt, right? You want to be 18, 20 inches above there to get your nozzles to get 100% overlap so you're painting those leaves from both angles. Uh, not saying that that's not a better way to do it than the airplane, but still ideally we would like to be up above that corn we're making that product uh, application so we can cover it. Uh, there's one a, a case sprayer up there and they're not known for being tall like some of the Haggies, but you can tell pretty easily if he had those booms out and up, he'd be able to get that full pass on there. So. When that's coming out over the next couple of years, they're actually starting that trait, thankfully, in the 110 to 113 day range. Usually when it, like smart stacks or something comes out, they start that crap in Canada and it takes forever to get here. Um, but they're gonna be starting it out closer at our maturity range. And it's gonna allow you, if you have 
hybrid ABC one, two, three that you really like, you're going to be able to buy that in a smart corn version or a, a shorter version or a double pro. So there's going to be different layers that you can get. So we're not going to have to change the genetics necessarily. It's going to be a trait that's just added into it. Uh, what we have up there on the hill, it's, it's on the early side. So it, it's going to be more of the genetic platform that they're going to use to pull that trait out of, to put it in the new corn. So that doesn't have any type of trade on it. So you guys are feel free to, to get in there and look around and see. How tall will the shorter hybrid typically be? So you can see there's actually, there's a couple different types up there. Uh, one of them is probably a little bit shorter than me and the other one's maybe six, eight inches taller. Uh, we're not gonna, when they put that short corn in there, that's gonna express differently on the hybrid. So there's gonna be a little bit of a step change to it, but there should be, a way that we can get across to all of them with a, a sprayer with hopefully out having to, to drag those booms across the tassels and get that coverage. So we've seen with like through contest winners, corn warriors, whatever it is you guys watch on YouTube, uh, you know that managing that crop later in the season is a big benefit where typically when I started doing this, it was like we, we posted the corn and then we stood back and watched. That's like taking your kid to third grade and dropping him off and saying, man, I hope he goes to college and becomes a doctor and makes something out of himself. So we know that that's important to manage that through the whole season. This is gonna allow us to do that. So where we already feel tired and everything else with all the crap that we gotta do now, we're gonna have to figure out to be competitive, you know, and to compete against yourselves and your acres, we're gonna have to manage that season long, so. Is that the only reason is to get over it spraying or is there other benefits? I mean, they'll, so like there's also like they put these hybrids in, in extreme green snap prone areas where they know they're going to get it. And I've seen some of those blocks where there's a, a rectangular section in the center of a hundred acre field. That's these small strip tiles of the short strip tiles of the short corn and every, every stalk is standing. So we know like some of the bottom ground where we don't see it every year, but we see it often enough that it would be nice to have that stacking that node closer together is going to be pretty important for helping with wind. And, and that takes out, sometimes we don't place the hybrid that we really wanted to in that situation because it's like, damn, that stuff could blow down. But this way we can get that genetics and, and get the, the standability. Another thing is residual, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, residue, crop residue, right? Yeah. So the whole carbon market, the carbon programs and the carbon footprints that are out there that are being discussed today, and the pressures that are being put on that, that's another piece of that as well. So your below ground is not going to change, right? Your root system, you think everything's shorter, uh, you're going to have a smaller root system. That's not going to change, okay? Uh, but above ground is what is. That's the, just the overall yeah. height of that. Just so. the difference between the nodes. Between Leaf the size, nodes. everything else yep. is the same. So, yeah. be, so there should be the same amount of leaves. Yes. Yep. Yep. Less, less, less actual true stalk, though. Okay. It, it, yep. it is. It'll be a game changer for us. And they are making it to where those hybrids, they're making sure that when they're advancing them and how they're putting these traits in, if they put that trait in and it causes it to put that ear too close, too close to the ground, yep. they're going to reinsert a different version of that into it. So that way, you know, we're not dragging our snoots on the ground to try to pick up corn. Uh, they're wanting to keep it at like 24 inches or That's something. Minimum. minimum is 24 inches, which is still fairly low in my mind. All right, they'll be around.